Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. My name is Will Owen, and I'm, uh, I use he, him, or they, them pronouns, and I am a first year MFA here at UPenn, and I have the um, total delight uh, and honor to introduce Stephanie Suhuko. Um, yeah. Um, but first, uh, I, I just want to recognize and acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania stands on the indigenous unceded territory known as Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the Lenape people. And we recognize that the Lenape, also known as Leni Lenape descendants, remain here and that many have been forcibly removed elsewhere. Uh, this acknowledgement is not a final statement, but an invitation to myself and to us to continue this active understanding and uprooting of settler colonial culture, and that this land is the land of the Lenape past, present, and future. Um, yeah, and again, I have the, the total honor to introduce Stephanie, and um, yeah, I'll jump right in. Um, uh, Stephanie works in photography, sculpture, and installation, moving from handmade and craft-inspired mediums to digital editing and archive excavations using critical wit and collaborative co-creation. Her work or her projects leverage open source systems, shareware logic, and flows of capital in order to investigate issues of economies and empire. Recently, she has focused on how photography and image-based processes are implicated in the construction of racialized, exclusionary narratives of history and citizenship. Um, I want to first rec recommend everyone read her piece uh, in the Freeze magazine this, from this past December uh, 2020, an article, What Can We Learn from Ruth Asawa? And in this article, Sihuko speaks about finding a pre-Black Mountain College, Ruth Asawa's name, in the archives of the Smithsonian, while an artist research fellow at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Sihuko describes the camouflaging and visibility that simultaneously takes place when an artist who is forced as a teenager to live in a Japanese internment camp in California, as well as Arkansas, is featured on the United States Forever postage stamp. Suhuko works as a rare artist navigating between platforms of the commercial art world, academia, the public, and sometimes the overlap between them. In her work, Added Value, from 2018, at the San Francisco Museum of Art, um, a 1,500 square foot installation which functioned as a radical reorganization of knowledge using low value used books for sale to the general public. Conceived and organized by Stephanie Suhuko, featuring uh, related tactics, the Prillinger Library, the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library, and commissioned by the Public Knowledge Initiative at SFMOMA. The project raised $20,000 in just two days to benefit education and community programs at the San Francisco, or for the San Francisco Public Library. Um, in her work, she often focuses on the collective and social platforms as sites for creating artwork, and often speaks to the many hands and collaborators that work on the project. This relates to the subject and concept of her work around photographic and digital presentation of colored standards to situate historic and, and contemporary society. In her series, The Visible Invisible, historical costumes were on display most recently at the 2018 Renwick Invitational at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. These sculptural garments represent commonly understood moments of the American history but are fabricated entirely out of the green chroma key backdrop fabric. And chroma key fabric uh, is the visual effects technique commonly used for post-production, allowing a video or image uh, to superimpose new backgrounds behind the subject, kind of green screen. By calling attention to this removable background or backdrop and using it as the material to recreate historical costumes, this work questions how American history itself has been fabricated, constructed, and manipulated. 
in essence functioning as the projection screen for the convenient and inaccurate narratives. In 2019 and 2020, she was a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow at the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. She is featured in the season nine of the acclaimed PBS documentary series, Art 21. Um, uh, and then there's also an extra Art 21 section on, on YouTube that's available for free where you can see an amazing garden that, that Stephanie has as well. Um, recent exhibitions include Being New Photography at MoMA in New York City, Public Knowledge at the San Francisco Museum of Art, and Stephanie Suhuko Rogue States at the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis, and Disrupting Craft, as I mentioned before, the 2018 Renwick Invitational at the Smithsonian American Museum, uh, Art Museum. Uh, born in the Philippines in 1974, Suhuko received her MFA from Stanford and BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. She is the recipient of the 2014 Guggenheim Fellowship Award, uh, a 2009 Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Award, and a 2020 Tiffany Foundation Award. Her work has been exhibited very, very widely, and I'm only going to name some of them here, but um, I think it's important to name uh, MoMA PS1, the Whitney Museum of Art, uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Z ZKM Center for Art and Technology, the California Biennial of at uh, California Biennial at the Orange County Museum of Art, the 12th Havana Biennial, and the 50, uh, 2015 Asian Art Biennial in Taiwan, among many, many others. Um, and also, Stephanie is a longtime educator and is associate professor, professor in sculpture at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, yeah. We're so lucky to have you, Stephanie, and thank you so much for your time and uh, for your labor, and thank you for your artwork. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Will. That was a wonderful um, introduction, and actually, it was so thorough. Um, Will actually described a bunch of projects that I'm going to be sharing, so um, in a way, you've, you've got the preview of it, but um, let me just go ahead and start here. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I think originally when I was contacted, I can't remember whether it was pre-COVID or not. So, you know, usually I have the, um, the pleasure of being present and getting to know everybody. So I appreciate people coming together, you know, even on this um, online platform. I guess um, what I'm gonna do is share uh, work that uh, only is from about the last four years. And I'm doing that just because, you know, I, I don't wanna throw it too wide. But I did kind of shake it up a little bit because um, I'm thinking about the events of Tuesday in which um, anti-Asian violence uh, erupted and uh, pretty much you know, made clear things that have been happening for a very long time actually. But you know, the, the media is finally paying attention to it. So the, how I'm gonna weave that in though is um, through highlighting and talking about the works that I feel like deal with visibility and invisibility because in general, a lot of my projects, um, especially recently, um, have been a kind of direct response to the political impacts of a, a, an American government that is actively, that was, was actively engaged in um, uh, extreme marginalization of anyone who wasn't a part of, you know, the kind of standard narrative of who is and who isn't American. So um, the title of the talk I'm, I'm sharing is called The Visible Invisible. Um, we'll see how far I get, because as I was saying, I kind of shook it up a little bit. So I'm not sure um, you know, what the timing on this is gonna be, but um, let's go ahead and start. So um, as was mentioned, you know, a lot of my projects are actually pretty large scale. Um, I, I'm known for uh, installations that sometimes incorporate hundreds or even thousands of objects. Sometimes they're participatory. Usually they're sponsored or commissioned in some way by different institutions. So sometimes they fall into you know, social practice categories or um, you know, installation or a kind of like public practices um, segment. But I'm not gonna focus too much on it. I just wanted to give some background for you know, the, the visualities of, of what I do. Um, it also rotates among a lot of different physical um, and digital constellations. And I love the you know, kind of spreading it out around different arenas. So even though I kind of center it around sculpture, 
the um, you know the 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 sort of uh, accessories around that range from everything from you know textiles and craft to photography and digital imaging to new media and then also to you know social practice uh, projects that include workshops and uh, print publications. So I think obviously that's the beauty of you know being a contemporary artist today. Um, there's also these kind of spheres that I feel like I engage in, and so you know. Loosely, these are very loose, you know, the public, the art world, and the academy. So, as Will also mentioned, you know, sometimes these things intersect and sometimes they actually kind of fall a bit far away from each other, depending on um, its perception. Um, but, you know, to circle back to this notion of, I guess, the, uh, the politics of representation. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've been focusing specifically on these very, um, I guess, uh, um, fabricated notions of both image making and also uh, narrative, especially when it comes to American history and American belonging. And so what you're looking at here is obviously a, um, you know, a, a formal photography studio setup. Um, and I think it's fascinating to kind of show, you know, all the apparatus around the making of an image, which can also then be seen as uh, the apparatus around the making of a story. And it's, it's quite constructed actually. So um, I'll launch in with the first project, um, Added Value, which I'm actually sharing because I think it, it starts to articulate some of uh, my interest in the very foundation of how we organize knowledge and how that influences and impacts um, our own uh, perception of reality. So um, as was mentioned, it was a 1500 square foot installation and it functioned essentially as a used bookstore. So when the public came to the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, um, you know, they entered into it and they knew how to act uh, or they knew how to interact with it, which was, you know, as a vending platform. But as they started to go through the different sections, they noticed a kind of um, total reorganization of the standard uh, areas. So instead of, you know, the usual situation of, say, history section, um, uh, what is it like women's studies, you know, all these kind of standard areas of how we usually um, aggregate and collect knowledge. I threw that open to create these, I guess, alternative um, uh, categories so that the books that, uh, could be reshuffled and form a different logic structure. So you'll notice here, you know, everything from there's a section on revolutions, uh, wealth and accumulation, collapse. And what this forced was a kind of new reckoning with how to um, handle, uh, you know, the, the knowledge that we feel like we already think we understand the category in which it falls in. So uh, the fun thing was this was a project that I uh, collaborated. I, I invited uh, three other collectives to, um, to work with me on it. And so we all had a hand in kind of creating these subcategories. And you know, so everything from when your culture becomes a trend was a subcategory to white women discovering themselves amongst the other. And you know, these, these kind of fun and playful ways uh, were engaging for the visitors because in many cases, finally people could maybe see these uh, set forms of knowledge through the lenses that they were actually experiencing it instead of you know, through a kind of hierarchical top-down structuring that's based on you know, generally the, um, uh, the hierarchy of empire. So, uh, you know, like what would you find in the category of uprisings? And how does that also create a kind of, you know, inter, um, interrelated and interconnected new category instead of segmenting things out globally or by, um, I guess, niche or, you know, subgenre? Um, it threw it all open. And I also started to, to create uh, confused categories. So craft and witchcraft, was a collapsed category. So within that, you could find everything from, you know, casting spells to origami paper folding. And, you know, thinking of both those forms as craft. Uh, I refuse to have a women's studies section because I feel like that in itself is a kind of, you know, it, it segments things out. And what if we turned that on its head and had a section called men's studies, which in essence looked at masculinity and patriarchy as a theme. And so within that, you know, we could reshuffle and create this wonderful look at, um, uh, uh, at maleness, at men, instead of, you know, uh, the, the category of women was across the entire uh, bookstore, as of course it should be. Um, this is a, a, a look at the, I think, the section called Radical Desires. So, uh, you know, the Scarlet Letter in with um, softcore porn and then 
you know, this great book of women without children, because that's also a, a wonderful uh, why reproduce. Um, and then the, we also played it with, uh, or I played with notions also of um, pairings. So I shrink wrapped pairs of books based on what I felt um, were kind of uh, opposites, but totally interrelated. So Victorian gardens was shrink wrapped uh, on the other side of culture and culture and imperialism by Edward Said. So you were forced to buy the pair of books and then reckon with that kind of um, what those two things said about each other. Similarly, you know, with these uh, kind of vintage books, and we were dealing with um, uh, thousands of vintage books that were considered low value. So these were cast off by bookstores and also libraries. Um, they were also donated uh, to be sold uh, by the library. So a lot of these did not have um, high value. And so my challenge was to kind of create a new uh, meaning for them, you know, both in these subcategories and also in the, um, the pairings. My favorite pairing, and this was before I shrink wrapped it, was, you know, Bill Gates's The Road Ahead with Collapse by Jared Diamond. Um, and, you know, this was a two day project. It was a quick and dirty, fast thing. We sold thousands of books and made um, over $20,000. Um, mostly from books that were uh, priced between $2 and $10. So, you know, it's it was the kind of back end also of creating a, um, a uh, an economic structure for the education department at the San Francisco Public Library. And I do think about those things sometimes in my projects where it's not just a kind of either metaphoric or, um, you know, descriptive uh, project, but it has a kind of um, uh, impact, perhaps economically. Uh, so this is a, a kind of layout of some of the, um, the categories as the two days were happening. So, you know, back again, though, to this notion of like what's highlighted and what isn't. Um, I've, I've also been thinking a lot about how digital imaging technologies operate, because um, specifically with, you know, the ease of kind of transferring um, or substituting out or changing entire backgrounds or um, depictions of, you know, reality. You know, the chroma key green screen backdrop is this very standard way in which um, you can very easily um, in post-production swap out a backdrop. Also the Photoshop transparency layer, for those of you that are familiar with um, digital imaging in Photoshop, you know, that's like the very last layer um, at the very back that you're actually not supposed to see, you know, it's invisible, even though it's this pretty intense checkerboard uh, pattern. So I've been thinking about these as, you know, forms of invisibility, but which are highly visible. And the kind of parallel that we see uh, in society today, and specifically in thinking about white supremacy. So, you know, I'm going to be like really, um, uh, what is it, uh, uh, upfront about this because I feel like metaphor sometimes gets lost. Um, in 2017, as a professor at UC Berkeley, I experienced a huge wave of uh, uh, white supremacist and right-leaning um, speakers who are coming to the university and taking advantage of the free speech uh, notion in order to um, pretty much platform really hateful ideas. And there were protests on campus, and this was immediately after the 2017 inauguration of you know, the Trump administration, and a lot was at stake. Um, I think right now we're still seeing, obviously, the after effects of having let that situation uh, grow. And um, it's interesting now to think back on four years ago where I, I started to really notice it and make work about it. Because at the time I felt that um, it was actually very difficult to, um, to share. Like a lot of people weren't seeing the things that I felt I was seeing. So the first show I, I did in relationship to some of these like problems, because I was, I was attending and witnessing a lot of protests on campus. And I was also seeing how the news media was completely um, conflating and skewing both sides in a way that um, was completely, you know, not reality and not happening. And uh, so I turned my attention to creating an exhibition that uh, made very physical some of the, um, I guess, the digital uh, um, editing that I thought was taking place in images of protests and also its narrative framing. So citizens at Ryan Lee Gallery consisted of uh, both photographs and sculptures. Um, I was cutting out uh, uh, images of a particular banner um, that I was seeing uh, uh, a lot actually at these Berkeley protests and uh, reproducing them in such a way that just like the photo of them, 
the legibility of the text was obscured because of um, the way that it was being held. So um, it's you can't actually read it, or I think it's very difficult to read, but this is you know literally the way the photograph was portraying it. I blew it up to real size and then handmade a, a sewed version and then kept the, um, the threads loose in order to kind of signify this uh, potentially, you know, the undoing of it or even like the unfinished nature of um, this endeavor of protest. Um, it was also held up, uh, you know, with these steel structures and there were these odd cutouts. Um, see if I can go back, these odd cutouts at the bottom that uh, were actually uh, people's heads that I had, you know, cut out. And so, you know, their absence was very palpable in these works. Um, it also went along with a series of uh, portraits and the portraits were restaged reenactments of anti-fascist protesters that I worked with UC Berkeley undergraduate students to produce. So, um, you know, anti-fascist protesters show up at, uh, at, at situations in which uh, direct action is going to happen. And uh, it's very difficult to photograph them because in the end you wind up having, uh, risking exposing them to being um, recognized. And you know, hence all the covering up that you see of Antifa. And so, but how do you kind of memorialize or even create a kind of visualization of that without risking people? I worked with students who also attended the protest and witnessed it to act as stand-ins. And we created these kinds of composites of, of people we saw in order to you know, depict them, but to depict them safely or depict them in a way also which implicated the students themselves and maybe thinking of themselves as uh, future and even current resistors to the political system. So um, these are all called, uh, they're portraits and under the, sub, under the main title citizens. Um, and, the in the in behind the entire thing was a completely hand sewn quilted cotton backdrop that was 13 feet by 26 feet, all made out of two inch uh, uh, fabric squares. So it was uh, 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 fabricating what appeared to be, you know, maybe this digital Photoshop backdrop, but with the handmade quality, you know, you could go around it and you could see like all the um, the seams and the very physicality of it. Because I also really wanted to stress the total fabrication of these narratives. Um, in other words, that you know, if even a digital image uh, uh, crossing your screen very quickly can be something that's uh, very stage managed and also uh, very purposefully narrated in order to change its meaning. And along with that exhibition too, I, I worked on a, um, a project that was dealing directly with the incarceration of Japanese Americans in 1942. So, you know, um, this is obviously a, a, a a situation that lives in infamy, but you know, to resuscitate it um, made a lot of sense in 2017 because the administration was talking about and and did segment out people into camps. And so, um, you know, thinking in our not so recent past, uh, also uh, in the Bay Area, you know, this is a, a photograph by Dorothea Lang in Oakland, California. Uh, taken of a Japanese American business who um, the the business person put this sign up. Um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in order to kind of try to express to the rest of the public that, you know, I am an American. Um, unfortunately, the individual had to sell the business and was sent to an internment camp. So, you know, that, that, uh, that didn't work. Um, and by resuscitating that sign, um, I created a kind of inverted version of it, a, a fabric panel that uh, acts as a room divider um, it's about 24 feet long, and um, and when it's displayed, the word American is compressed, and so it's always there, but it's retracted in a way to kind of like deny both the legibility of of the word, but also as a kind of retraction of the rights of say Americans or American citizens, um, and and perhaps maybe even a collapse and change of the notion of who constitutes an American, depending on, you know, what the political moment looks like. So, you know, that also was tied into a, um, a portrait of another individual who I felt was unable to be photographed. And so total transparency filter portrait of N was an undocumented uh, individual that I was working with at UC Berkeley, a student actually, um, who uh, I asked to sit for me and then uh, covered with a digital print of the Photoshop transparency filter. 
both as a way to protect this person because as an undocumented uh, individual, she was now heavily at risk for deportation and discovery and also um, to signify this potential of her removal. And again, you know, the dilemma of how do you show something that's unshowable? Um, the, what, what can you make visible um, and what should remain invisible? Um, along with those works were a series of photographs based on uh, uh, reconstructing uh, protest scenes like the aftermath of protest scenes I would see um, on the streets, because there were some pretty intense street battles um, at the time. And, you know, witnessing like all the things that were left over, I decided to recreate some of those uh, items, but all using chroma key uh, painted objects and uh, fabric and hand, uh, hand making everything. So the chroma key aftermaths are a kind of like, uh, again, this uh, blank uh, space in which you know the media was filling in narratives of what what was actually happening and what wasn't happening. So you know, also in thinking about U.S. history, I I like to implicate myself because you know, as an American, as a Filipino American, and as a um, you know someone who both uh, uh, benefits from and also is uh, you know highly critical of the foundations of this country. Um, I looked backwards for a project um, in which I was thinking about historical reenactment because somehow that never goes away. <laughs> you know, there's a there's an amazing kind of like a, a structure around, especially civil war reenactments, and a, a huge culture about it. And for me, this question of like, well, what what is the obsession, right, with playing this out all the time? Like, why does this come back? It's like we've never let it go, right? Um, so looking at the uh, uh, the costumes around it, specifically from uh, uh, sewing companies like Macal's and Simplicity that were making these costumes both for reenactments, but also for um, theatrical um, plays and events. Um, I collected a number of them that I felt were um, indicative of a kind of iconic American narrative. Drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. Let me drop it. Maybe just then hand constructed them uh, using a green screen chroma key uh, fabric backdrop. So everything you see here is actually, it's, it's handmade uh, by myself. Um, the, the project is called The Visible Invisible because I was also choosing um, significant costumes that I felt related to important memories, uh, important moments in American history that were actually uh, narrated incorrectly. So if we think about you know, the founding of the country through the Plymouth Pilgrim, uh, also the beauty of the antebellum South or the promise of the colonial revolution, all those things bear um, a lot of untold uh, narratives. Um, and you know, we could obviously get into that uh, quite far, but the, um, the, the reason I wanted to hand make everything was I also wanted to implicate myself in the total production of these historical, quote unquote, historical objects. So I learned 19th century ribbon embroidery, uh, lace crochet techniques, uh, making a bonnet from scratch. Uh, because again, you know, I by remaking it by hand, um, it was this 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 total investment in trying to understand, you know, like all the elaborateness of these stories, right? So um, the, this is, uh, what is it, uh, um, a Victorian uh, ribbon flowers. Uh, and actually, I, I gained a lot of skills, which is pretty amazing from this. But so the work was shown at the Smithsonian at the Renwick Gallery, which is the main craft gallery. And I really wanted it to look historic. I, I wanted it to also, in a way, interrupt the kind of flow of you know, the historical objects that one usually sees at museums, such as the Smithsonian. Uh, this is, yeah, the Plymouth Pilgrim, uh, Colonial Revolution. And um, following on that, um, I also worked on a project that uh, dealt with flags as a kind of um, stand-in for both uh, nationalist fears as well as projections of a kind of like dangerous other. So Rogue States uh, debuted in 2018 in Moscow, which I actually think is kind of funny. Uh, um, the, uh, and it can, looks like a kind of collection of flags that may or may not represent something like the United Nations. 
you know, you can kind of pick through it and see these references to maybe, um, you know, colors that look like certain, um, uh, you know, uh, areas of the world or symbols. Everything looks kind of vaguely familiar as a nationalist flag in some way or a national flag. Um, and but <clears throat> on closer inspection, there's a um, a little plaque that was kind of put up uh, that explained or or laid out uh, the, the symbol the meaning of these flags. They're all pulled from Hollywood and European movies in which there was a kind of fictional um, country that was made up and also pushed forward as the enemy uh, of the movie. So everything here from uh, these are some of the movies that it pulled from. So, you know, Die Hard 2, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, Commando. And, you know, it ranges from like a, a comedy to drama to, uh, you know, to action and adventure. But the entire thing is really this, uh, this, this collected uh, uh, anxiety and fear of this other. And so the, the, by putting them all together was this way to kind of, um, uh, almost make them have a, uh, a conference together in terms of thinking about, well, what, why are these, uh, what is, uh, why are, why is so much projected onto, um, you know, enemy states? Um, and most recently, actually, I'm kind of showing this one for the first time. I did an exhibition at the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, called Multi-Ethnic People Smiling. And it just consists of these uh, uh, vinyl uh, wall panels that are put up with text. And as you go around the room, uh, they sort of describe or seem to be describing this scenario um, in which you're actually not able to look at an image, but maybe by reading this caption, you can kind of think about what that would look like. And so multi-ethnic group of people smiling row of multi-ethnic babies sitting side by side, looking away, isolated on gray background, close-up face of happy multi-ethnic children embracing each other. And what, where these are pulled from, uh, okay, multiracial best friends, millennials taking selfie outdoors with backlighting, happy youth friendship concept against racism with international young people having fun together, Azure filter tone. These are actually um, pulled from, uh, Oh, stock photos, sorry, that's not Benetton, it's not from Benetton, from stock photo searches for diversity. So um, the, these are the captions that were given by the photographer who was uploading to them to the site. And um, in all cases, they offer this incredibly optimistic view of what a multi-racial, multi-ethnic society looks like. And it's almost to the point where, you know, it reminded me a lot of the early Benetton ads I would see growing up in the 80s, where there's this unproblematic kind of like togetherness in which, you know, nobody is having any form of racial tension and there's nothing to kind of trouble an image like this. And so, you know, in doing this search, this is actually from one of the stock photo sites, you know, you, you type in diversity or, or multi-ethnic or any of those things and everyone is incredibly happy. Everyone is getting along. And it's this like almost willful amnesia or denial of any of the, um, the fallings, failings or shortcomings of this actual reality. So, you know, what, what does that say then? Like, you know, what, what does it mean to, to kind of like be confronted with these possibilities, but no clear um, reckoning as to what it's gonna take to get there and no actual, you know, kind of um, proposition for it. So you know, I find these images fascinating because you know, it makes me think about who is making them and why, and also you know, what, what we're leaving out. So there's a whole other subcategory of stock photos of protests that are crazy. Um, they have blank signs. And so you're, I guess you're supposed to put you know, whatever image into or text into it in order to kind of like, you know, uh, illustrate your article or um, uh, uh, what, yeah, your article on a protest. And so I was thinking a lot about what this means, you know, like what is so interchangeable about these things to the general American public and maybe even this gap in how white America, what they think is wanted or needed. And, you know, again, these are just stock images. I, and I don't use them as work and I don't show them as work. This is just, you know, I'm just sharing with uh, them to you as a, something to, to think about. Um, 
But, you know, again, it's like, I think about, well, you, you know, these are literally headlines from yesterday. And, you know, if, if you look at the one on the left, it was really one of the first ones I read. Um, the, you know, it presents uh, eight killed in Atlanta area, raising fear of anti-Asian violence, you know, very factual, all these things happening. And then I highlighted the motive was unclear, you know, because it, to me, that was this form of weird, like gaslighting where you can, you can give as much information as you can about it. And yet the motive is still unclear. And then the same with, you know, so on the right, it's a little better. I think they actually put white supremacy up in there. That, that's actually really great. I actually think that's wonderful. But I also think it's interesting too that it, it haunts us. <laughs> it, it haunts us versus like it, you know, instead of it doing something else, which is actually much more um, violent and uh, intense than just a haunting. So, um, you know, I, I wonder about the framing of these things because the, the, the people in, who are in power and are writing these headlines and writing these captions, they are obviously, um, there are certain things that are very invisible. And so, you know, what does that mean? And when I go backwards in time, I look at archives and I do that in order to kind of think about why and how we got here. Um, because as much as I'm excited and interested in creating the images for our future, I also think that um, it's really still for me at least important to revisit the past because um, we're still building on those foundations. So uh, most recently I've been doing projects at um, archives and historical societies where I've been going in and uh, uh, re-looking uh, at photographs. So this was, um, I would call it a photographic intervention actually in the archives of the Missouri Historical Society. So in 2019, I was invited to be in an exhibition at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. Uh, and I did a little bit more research and it turns out that in 1904 in St. Louis, the World's Fair was held and the World's Fair um, had a uh, 1200 imported Filipinos that were then put on display in a fake Filipino village. And this was because the Philippines was a US colony at the time. So in 1904, the, um, or in the early 1900s, the United States acquired the Philippines by winning a war with Spain. And so there, the colonizing endeavor um, started full force. And with that were uh, photographs, documents, and all sorts of um, things that were collected in order to kind of understand and learn more about their new peoples. And with that came a kind of educational component for the American public. So uh, in showing images and photographs of, um, of other peoples, it was a way for white Americans specifically to also uh, keep in place the kind of racial hierarchy that had always been set for centuries prior. And so, you know, that it kind of, it dovetails in really well actually with um, the, the, um, the way American history was, uh, was narrating itself. And so as I was going through these photographs though, um, you know, I'm sitting in the archives, I have my, um, tripod and a camera there, I decided that one way to maybe not erase the images because you know these are historical documents, but how do you intervene in them a hundred years later? And so what I wound up doing was literally going through, you know, multiple, multiple, multiple images, everyone that I found and just blocking them, blocking them from view because the, these images were produced specifically for the consumption of pretty um, uh, ethno, uh, ethnocentric notions of uh, racial hierarchy in which white people were at the top and uh, brown people in the Philippines were very close to the bottom. So, you know, by, by blocking them, it was a way to kind of, uh, I, I felt like restoring a kind of humanity to the subject matter, as well as still leaving intact the whole apparatus in which they uh, were originally presented. Because again, I don't want to deny that these things happen, but I want to talk back to it in some way. So these are my fingers and hands, um, you know, doing this in the archive. And then um, it was presented. I mean, there's, I have so many of these. It was presented in the end as a kind of physical display called Block Out the Sun. And, you know, thinking too about how photography went hand in hand with the creation of racialized narratives. Um, you know, a photo is usually made by exposure of light onto a surface. And so a lot of my um, uh, titles recently have actually had photographic um, uh, references in them, specifically to think about how imaging technologies are implicated in these, uh, in these constructions, really, you know.
So back to the notion of a construction. And oh, I love these types of charts. So, you know, I, I used to work as a graphic designer um, and I was always given these color charts to look at, to compare, you know, and make sure that my color on my screen was accurate and what I was printing was accurate. And, you know, these types of printing charts plus photographic calibration charts are the kind of foundation of good color, whatever that means. Um, and so this is one of the early Adobe Systems calibration charts called Ole No Moire. And I love it because it has this like faux Carmen Miranda figure there, happily, you know, dressed in colors. But then I, on her hat, you can see it says Adobe in blocks. And so it's this kind of weird mashup of like objects, color, and culture that makes no sense at all. And I'm supposed to look at it to then make sure that the thing that I'm working on is correct. <laughs> So I always thought it was really fascinating. And then doing more um, investigations into color charts, there's always this uh, fascinating um, kind of collection of what is standard, right? And what, what we always compare all other images to. So whether that's still life scenes or, um, you know, happy white people, it's very, um, it's very typical. And then there's, it's also interesting too, then when sort of uh, racialized figures come into play, because there's this very um, kind of delineated dynamic in which they also operate in, in these charts. This is a, a German color, uh, skin color chart. Um, and so it manifested in an installation in St. Louis that was uh, inspired by both the history of its uh, notorious Philippine village in 1904 at the World's Fair as well as contemporary references to color calibration charts, uh, museum collections, and uh, uh, current political iconography. So it operates for me as a kind of display of both objects and images. And in many cases, I'm downloading images from the internet. I just rampantly download them, print them, and then display them as these kinds of stand-ins for objects. And then there's also real objects that have been painted chroma key green or uh, laser cut flat printed objects. And this kind of like, um, I would say like shuffling and layering of references, because I want these things to be very confusing. And I actually want to kind of like blur uh, boundaries of legibility. So we have everything from like traditional Filipino textiles to contemporary cosmetic uh, skin charts to um, uh, old herbaria, um, uh, like plant material gathered on anthropological expeditions to the Philippines to then these um, kind of green uh, chroma key objects that may or may not hint at white supremacist tiki torches and mega hats. And you know, all these things can be read into. There's also tropical fruit with, you know, pulled from stock photo sites. Um, uh, and these little emojis that kind of populate everything too, as if, you know, attempting to kind of comment and uh, uh, on what's being displayed. And I, I really wanted the viewer to look hard. So these are just some details of scenes. So there's, you know, every time you kind of shift your view, you can see a new object or a new narrative. There's a lot of images of people looking into mirrors or looking out at you or looking back at you. Um, there's also, uh, I think, you know, for some maybe like esoteric uh, visual references, like this is uh, Alfred Krober, who is a famous anthropologist for finding Ishi, last of the California Yahi um, indigenous uh, people in California, and also a UC Berkeley uh, professor at the time. Um, and then also objects and images uh, downloaded from both Amazon.com and uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection of Filipino objects, and then printed and adhered to laser cut uh, backings. So, you know, this, this kind of mashup and conflation, uh, there's rocks and bricks and, uh, and uh, um, anti-fascist resistor masks all in there as well, because I wanted to also hint at this, uh, this kind of collapse of both historical reference as well as contemporary problem. And that, you know, we can't, we can't relegate history to a kind of like dustbin of having gotten over it, that it's, it's, it's like this eternal return. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, and I also see it as a kind of like alternative uh, museum display because, you know, you go to see these uh, displays that kind of narrate, you know, a scene or something on them. Well, what, where did this one come from? You know, like who's imagining this scene? And the other thing I also wanted to kind of like share was, so, you know, this is a, a, a an ethnographic photograph of a child, um, a Filipino child taken 
in St. Louis at the World's Fair. He was also imported along with his family. And you know, these, these photos are, uh, uh, they were highly circulated and very popular. They made people's careers, you know, just like Edward Curtis with images of uh, native peoples. You know, uh, people made a lot of money off of these types of images. And so this is a staged studio shot. And then I found this one. And I thought this one was really interesting too, because obviously it's staged. It's the same child. Um, this one is in, the, in his village, uh, the fake village, but he's been posed with the camera. And he's been posed as if now he's, he's going to take the camera uh, to take the picture. And I started thinking about what that means, you know, of like kind of not just flipping the lens, but also, you know, what, what types of images could be generated with a, a different form of agency. So what I'm going to go into now is actually an exhibition that's up right now in San Francisco called Native Resolution. Um, this is actually the last uh, show that I'm going to be uh, um, sharing. And it's a uh, it's a series of all uh, image and photo based works, uh, all mostly culling from my Smithsonian um, Artist Research Fellowship at the National Museum of American History. Uh, because as Will mentioned in 2019, 2020, I was a fellow there, an artist fellow for um, about, I spent about two months there. And my project was looking for a photographic evidence of the Philippines in the Museum of American History. That seems like a pretty straightforward um, uh, a task, uh, but I was using it as a test case to find out how American empire envisioned its colony. Like what is the visual evidence of that and what story does that tell? Not anything about reality or about truth, but more of like, what does, what does if going through the archive, what does the archive itself say and what is missing? And so it turns out well, this is just an exhibition view, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly go through it just to show the image-based uh, kind of narration of it. Um, the walls were all painted um, uh, neutral gray. I, I like working with this specific gray color, which is actually digital photographic neutral gray. And it's kind of like the photo gray card that uh, traditional uh, photographers use. Um, and so all the walls are neutral gray. And it's kind of actually an ironic commentary because I, I actually don't believe anything is neutral. But um, the, uh, what we're seeing here are also uh, all photographs that are pulled um, and reconstituted from the archive. And to, uh, oh, and, and also a video component of Block Out the Sun. So that's the exhibition views. And I'm gonna dissect a little bit about some of the works. So the three main, I, I would call them like collaged or hand assembled um, works are all using images either uh, downloaded from or re-photographed from the Smithsonian archive. Um, this, this one is called Pile Up in parentheses Eastman. And um, it, uh, the main image in the back is actually a highly uh, digitized and pixelated image of the type of camera that would have been used during um, the colonial American period in the Philippines. And the reason it's so pixelated though is because um, it literally is the resolution of the image that I was given. And the interesting thing about the archives too is that they are these imperfect uh, structures. That the weird beauty of the archive is that um, a lot of things are not cataloged correctly, or they're mislabeled, or they're um, uh, not uh, they're impartially uh, uh, narrated, and they're also low resolution, which is really great because in in some of the transfer between analog objects and then their digital proxy sometimes information got lost. So um, the, the background image uh, was actually high, a highly pixelated camera and all the um, photographs that were um, layered on top, and these are physically collaged on, so it's not a digital kind of composite, had to do with um, this uh, very specific um, uh, evidence that I was finding regarding the Philippines. And I can literally, um, you know, explain what each thing means, but I'll spare you from that and just give you some of the highlights. So the top, uh, on the top left of the kind of composite image um, is a, a photo from, uh, of black Buffalo soldiers that were sent to the Philippines to also quell the Filipino rebellion. And, you know, they were sent from Teddy Roosevelt and it actually uh, brought uh, forward a lot of really interesting predicaments in the African American community, because it was it was much discussed about well, why are we being sent overseas to quell, 
you know, these brown folks when we're still also fighting for representation here at home. Um, another interesting um, kind of addition, and you can see it kind of peeking on the left-hand side, like behind a, uh, a photo. Um, uh, on the right side, I've enlarged it, and it's a, a interesting example too of kind of the slippages of meaning. It's labeled Portrait of Man, 1900, and on the side, a scribble in Philippines with a question mark. And it's in the Anthropology Archives, and it's actually a photograph taken in Europe of the Philippine national history, uh, uh, national hero, Jose Rizal. So, you know, the fact that it, it winds up in the archives as a kind of unlabeled and unknown person when he is literally the most important uh, person uh, in uh, Philippine history, in recent Philippine history, um, is really fascinating because it obviously shows that the curatorial vision is not as, uh, as total in its knowledge base. Um, there's also a lot of other low resolution images and specifically, um, uh, I was interested in using low res images and printing them at high res because I also wanted to talk about that slippage of meaning. And this is specifically a photograph of a Philippine uh, resistor, a guerrilla fighter uh, during the Philippine American War who, um, it was originally a glass negative. So a glass negative that was then uh, photographed for microfilm uh, and then the microfilm was scanned uh, to this thing, and then they lost the glass negative. So I, I love the fact of this kind of, um, that this is the only evidence we have in the archive of both this event and this object. And so again, you know, this notion of a kind of loss of meaning and um, a kind of rupture or stutter of historical message. Um, Pilot Graspells was using the um, anthropology Anthropology, yeah, anthropology collection. And again, you know, I, I'm not going to dig through it except just to say that, you know, a lot of, uh, if there were any images of people, they were, they were either hidden or obscured behind other things and peeking through, or they have their back turned to the camera. And that was, um, that was on purpose. And the background image of um, uh, the work was actually, I think this is in the collection of U Penn, I think. Uh, on the right, it's a, a, a photograph of some ethnic brass bells. But what I love about it is that the color checker chart is actually larger than the object that it's photographing. And so the, the calibration chart itself enters the archive and is forever kind of wed to that object in terms of how it's received and researched. Um, and then, you know, uh, images also from the, uh, I guess the, what is it? The natural history section. So again, I, I'm going to skip through it really quickly. Uh, I have a whole other talk that I've done on this that's an hour long on just this exhibition that's actually up online that I can send um, uh, a link to. But um, I was also playing too with, uh, this is soft body fragments and it's a digital composite of uh, clay shards found in the Freer and Sackler galleries of Asian art in the Smithsonian. And I was thinking too about how these fragments um, kind of exist there forlornly in, in the archive without any kind of reference. And if I could somehow bring them back together to each other and create a kind of like larger body, you know, what, what speculatively could that look like? So this is literally just a kind of gentle um, digital layering of them to posit this notion of a, you know, a, a somehow like breathing new life or, or giving, um, making it whole somehow. And you know, there's also the reference to to in in ceramics and clay, the term uh, a clay body is used quite often to talk about the materiality and of a malleable substance. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through the rest of it actually, because I think we're coming up close to time. Um, the After Images series are a series of formal uh, photogravures that have been printed by Malawi Printing, which is a high-end uh, print printmaker um, in Portland. And we worked with uh, ethnographic photographs of uh, Filipinos that were taken at the World's Fair um, to print them very beautifully as photogravures. And then I would strategically crumple them in order to, again, you know, kind of deny the, um, the totalizing vision uh, of, uh, of the viewer. And I also titled them you know, in kind of deflective ways. So deflection of vision, interruption of vision, um, obstruction of vision, because I, I didn't want the focus again to be on this notion of, you know, are we looking at anything culturally real 
like it's absolutely fabricated, you know, from its staging as a as a fake village. But it was really the act of looking that I was interrogating. Like, what what do we um, what do are we supposed to learn and gain from looking at these images? And then another project was called Fixed Focus Dead Center, in which I was rephotographing these very important papers from an anthropologist named uh, Dean Worcester in which um, these documents actually became very um, important to the kind of educational foundation of Filipinos in the sense of that they were savage people that needed um, a kind of structure and education that the US could bring. But instead of re representing the, um, the documents on their own, I decided to rephotograph um, and center the errors and mistakes in the documents. So what you're seeing in the middle of each one is a kind of um, error and notation um, that was in the document itself, but then um, hopefully starts to show that the archive or these documents are fallible. Um, and so as you're looking at the edges though, you do pick up what the, um, these anthropology files are saying. And you, know, you can see the kind of like the categorization of people. And um, you know, I, want, I want to keep all that there, but again, it's, it's not centered and um, I didn't want to reproduce um, the language uh, uh, of, um, oh goodness, of violence, essentially. Um, and then I was also, you know, working in the archive again to kind of like layer um, and rephotograph things together. So, you know, this is actually a photograph of the, um, the photographer <laughs> of the photo underneath on top of the the photograph she took in order to also show you know that 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 viewing her lens was really how we were looking at the um, the photographed um and i was also inserting myself in these two so this is a, a project called double portrait available light in which you can see uh four versions of my shadow cast on top of a uh print so underneath it is a print that's covered with a sheer a piece of glassine archival glassine and so it's a double portrait because you know the original image was taken 100 years ago and there I am on top of it using the available light of the archive as to, to insert myself in this conversation. And I don't know if you can see it on your screen right now because it might be really hard, but there's actually a face. Um, the, 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 the sitter's face is on the other side of that piece of glassine and it's kind of in the middle in the dark spot. It's hard to see, but in the actual print, it's, it's there. And so um, again, you know, like, I can see it. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up. Actually, I could spend more time talking about it, but I, in a nutshell, you know, these these works. Um, well, I'll finish up with this one because speaking back to the archive is one thing, right? Like, there's a there's a kind of interesting thing to get access to these things, but there's also the knowledge that you will never change it. Like the archive itself is this, um, it has so much value, right? It has collected capital value. It has quote unquote educational value. It has all these things that um, are actually, you know, of value. Um, and, but yet it's so filled with things that do not at all counter necessarily the narrative that we're still working with today. In fact, they reinforce it. Because if you look at these older ethnographic photographs, they don't, they don't attest to anyone's humanity, generally. Um, and so I was trying to pull forward, um, I rephotographed a tiny a pamphlet, a tourist pamphlet of the Philippine village from 1904. And I zoomed in on their, um, on several people's faces um, and then blew them up based on my digital image to life size. Um, and so that's why they're highly pixelated and they're, they're put in the gallery space and hung at head height so that they're actually looking back at you. And as you're going through the exhibition, they do kind of like, oops, they come up. Oh, they, they, uh, they look back at you as you're looking at the documents that are supposed to kind of encompass them. And I was also hinting too at contemporary surveillance, right? Because you know the, the, the line between early photography and quantifying and qualifying people based on typology is still something that's used in say, you know, policing and security and surveillance. And so these are not historical things. They're actually, you know, there is a really direct line. So um, with there, I'm actually gonna stop. Um, I feel like that's, that's plenty. And I'd love to also open it up for questions and comments. So thank you.
So I'm wondering, how would you like to, to, um, to structure this? Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, that was incredibly compelling and interesting um, and generous. I think um, people can just unmute and ask a question or also post it in the chat. Great. Yeah, it was interesting uh, pulling this stuff together because honestly, two projects I haven't really talked about before. So Native Resolution literally just opened up a week and a half ago. I mean, it's brand new work. And you know, the stuff you see behind me is kind of like part of the leftovers that didn't make it into that show. And then the, um, what is it, multi-ethnic people smiling <laughs> was also something I haven't uh, really talked about yet. But I'm happy just to, you know, maybe talk a little bit more. I yeah. have a question, Stephanie. Yeah, please, Ken. Yeah, um, I hate to be the one to start, but, <laughs> but uh, I guess I have. A, I, I need a little bit of a preamble because um, I want to talk about um, how you situate your work as, uh, as uh, you know, social in the category of social practice, okay, or social engagement. Let's say art. Part and, of, it. part of it. Yeah, part of it, right? And um, and uh, and about uh, you know the kind of critique of any kind of challenge to capitalism is always um, based is always unsuccessful because you can never prevent innovations in art from eventually being incorporated into capitalism, right? That was, that was the classic, what uh, Theodore Adorno called the acculturation problem, yeah. right? And so that, um, you know, any kind of art that tries to critique capitalism is only a forestalling of the problem of its own incorporation into the system um, of, yeah. uh, of capitalism through art, right? And, uh, and then you even had, uh, you know, writers like Claire Bishop who we said even the rhetoric of social engagement in art actually dovetails with uh, overtly neoliberal agendas of replacing government uh, run social services by well-meaning artists who, who are civically engaged and are offering creative so solutions and, and so on. And, and to that end, uh, the right wing critique of, of left cultural workers was actually had some degree of truth, right? They, what they called radical chic, right? Mm. So that's just to kind of pre preamble. But like, but today we're in this moment where we have uh, quite prevalent and real potential for radical, um, real life transformation in terms of social movements, right? So it's just kind of social reckoning in terms of, uh, you know, Wall, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Me Too movement, all the, uh, you know, um, BLM, all the movements that have kind of been exacerbated by and, and uh, by intensified by uh, the pandemic as well in terms of social equity questions, right? So I guess my question is, you know, what, what does it mean for you at this point of making art as activism in the, pre in the kind of historical presence of such uh, widespread real life social movements? Oh, nice. Yeah, no, thanks for asking that. It actually, it reminds me of questions I get sometimes even from my students who, you know, want to be politically engaged and wonder, you know, well, does my art, you know, how, do, how, how should this like uh, relate to my art? And I actually have a pretty clear, I think, view of it, which is that I actually find art to be, at least maybe in my experience, this very limited sphere, like incredible, like for all the reasons you said, right? Like, we will always be, no matter how radical you make, the institution has commissioned you to do this thing. And they've, they've commissioned you to do it so that they don't have to do it. And that your thing as an artist is temporary and it makes everyone feel good and it looks good. So I've come to understand that. So I'm under no illusions actually that anything I do in the sphere of formal pub, of art in its formal kind of sense like that is actually as effective as I, as I would imagine it to be. But, um, okay, so I'm also really um, interested and uh, 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 I believe in direct action also. I believe that art does not have to be the place for that, you know, so that you, as an individual and as an artist, you go out, you do that thing in the world. Like you don't, don't worry about making art about politics, you know, or art about, uh, you know, protest or resistance, go do it. Um, but then when they do intersect, which is interesting, right? Because I have wanted, why do I want to make 
commercially sold works about protests. Like, why do I, you know, like, is that weird? And it's actually because I've realized that, um, so some of these things get into museums. And I know that sounds kind of weird, you know, I mean, that's great, right? Like, yay, I have my work collected in museums. But what that does is it forces the museum to steward an image or an idea that might it be interesting in other contexts in the museum. And I, I don't yet know, you know, what that means, but um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't do it with any illusion though, of like, uh, it, it's a totally corrupt system. Does that sound really depressing though? No, it makes, it makes total sense. But, uh, but I guess, what, what does it mean at this moment? Because it seems like we're in a kind of historical moment of uh, you know, widespread disillusionment, disparities about um, the way society uh, is and needs to change and, and to make uh, you know, socially engaged art at this moment, it seems, seems different than, or at least to me, it seems different than uh, like say, you know, 10 years ago. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm a little like, so, you know, the Capitol protest or protest, whatever that was, whatever happened uh, on the 6th of, um, of January. Was that January or February now? God. January. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like I've witnessed. So in 2017, when I was first starting to do the work about protest, it felt like a baby. It felt like these like very, you know, like little things maybe like I, you know, now it's like, it's taken over. Like the white supremacist movements are just like, they're all out there. And so I don't know, like as, as, um, as, uh, as hopeful as I am for quote unquote resistance movements to actually do something. The fact is white supremacy is steeped in every aspect of our country and institution. And figuring out how to get that out is not about going to protest in the streets. It's about some fundamental thing that I'm really unsure about how to, you know, to work with. So, you know, I mean, really like going to the American archives, right? The, the National Museum of American History is the, supposed to be the story of our nation. And it was incredibly incomplete, incredibly, you know, not there. And so it did not give me much hope actually. <laughs> But I'd love to hear from somebody else too, because I don't, I'm not supposed to be the arbiter of, you know, of potential for things. And maybe it's also because I'm, I've been so immersed in some pretty awful, like, you know, I think like images in history, it's really, it feels really hard to escape from it sometimes. I mean, on a practical level though, so like, you know, when the pandemic hit, I stopped making art for three months and I just went full-time sewing masks, you know, because I had the equipment and skills and I donated, uh, you know, I made and gave them out to orgs and, uh, and you know, local groups that couldn't, that couldn't get access to them. And so I made over a thousand, you know, and I, I, I sent all that out and that's not art, you know, I mean, I guess, no, it's not. And so, but I, I find that is also just as valuable as then spending the time making these other things, right? And I, I don't, I wasn't trying to seek attention for doing it, but because I was, as an artist was making them, people started collecting them, which is weird. And, you know, so it had that strange slippage. Don't worry about the silence. It's, uh, there's always these kind of interregnums and then there's always a question. Yeah, no worries. I'm going to turn on my light, though, because uh, my light's going down. Hang on. Oh, there's some questions. Actually, you know, well, one thing I can share, and this is kind of interesting, um, about maybe a year and a half ago, I was asked to speak at the core program in Houston. And so the core program is this kind of like postgraduate program where, you know, it's, it's very intense and uh, people, you know, are doing really great work, and I asked all of them outright because um, they were all doing what I thought were like very resistant work, you know. And I said, okay, well, if you were given a um, like a museum show, like you're invited to be in the Whitney Biennial, and all sorts of horrible things happened, and you were asked to pull out, you know, would you? And a lot of them said they wouldn't, 
because despite the fact that they're making these very resistant works, they also really valued their careers. And it was really fascinating. You know, like nobody wanted to, to, act, to pull out of the system, you know, because they to do so is to risk, obviously, you know, and yet there's a contradiction because if your work is a certain way, doesn't it make sense to do that? But I don't blame people for having, you know, their own reasons because that's a tough choice. And that's actually happening at a lot of places now, right? So like the MCA Chicago, there's artists like pulling out. There's also a fellow faculty member of mine who was part of Godzilla, which was the um, Asian activist group just pulled out because of um, the Chinatown uh, Museum's uh, um, collusions with building a new jail or support of building a, a prison in New York. So maybe that's, you know, like those, those decisions and those questions I think are really important. I have a, a question that's um, definitely a, well, somewhat of a change in subject. Um, my name's Ashlyn. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm really excited you're uh, here virtually. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how you approach working in an archive. And I think um, I'm interested in even the most like basic, boring, like habits that you have or um, processes that you, you know, test out. I mean, and I'm asking this in a completely self-serving way. This is something I try to do a lot and, um, you know, with the different degrees of success. And so I feel like I get stuck often because I think I see that I'm going to, I think I'm going to get some kind of answer. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> This is interesting then. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll respond to that. Can I share my screen to show you some images about uh, archival uh, investigations? Cause it, it actually, um, so I stopped before it, it was gonna get there, but okay, whoops. All right, so for me, this is what it looks like. Like this is, uh, so at the Smithsonian in the archive center, um, I have to comb through online databases uh, and then write down what I think I want to see because, and sometimes it's really hard to figure out because the references are really um, vague, you know, so I don't know if it's going to have what I want. So I was lucky in that I had almost, uh, I think, two months to like to do this, um, but it took a long time to, to search. And so what happens is I, I, um, I requested these files or boxes and then I get back you know, like whole stacks of them. And then I have to sit in a room constantly watched by other, by the archivist because you're not allowed to be alone with it in case something happens. And I can't really bring in anything else. Like I, there's a locker. So it's every, anything I can carry, uh, no pens um, and no extra lights. So th that's been really fascinating because I know some artists get these like super special privileges to like, you know, have a whole photo crew and then they bring out this thing and you know you can really make this amazing kind of image from it but mine are really uh i would say like low uh low uh stage production because they won't let me and so um you know for me it, it literally starts by obviously the online website interface uh um you know this is just like examples of what it looks like at the smithsonian and this is what it looks like a lot of times where here's my search for Filipino American. Zero, 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 zero. And then 29 websites, which just kind of vaguely talk about, you know, Filipino American. So uh, let's see. Oh, and here. So on the left, you can see, yeah, these are uh, um, what I'm what I try to figure out if it has anything in there that I want before calling it up to get the image. Um, and then a lot of times these really awesome things. So I have a whole other talk and my future show is gonna be all about all the damaged items found in the archives because I think also the, the metaphor of damage is beautiful. And so this isn't what I was looking for, but you know, this is a, a slide on better America and uh, on poverty. It's part of the lecture on poverty and it's absolutely scratched up. Like you can't see anything with it. And so I would say that for me, the most amazing thing about the archive are actually the divergences. And so my next show is gonna be all about the adjacent 
and maybe connected or maybe not connected things because that's kind of what I was able to find. Um, oh, I also take thousands of, of photos. So I don't know what I'm gonna use later. And so I just shoot, 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 shoot. You know, okay, try this thing, move this thing, shoot, shoot. So these are things that I maybe go back to later to see if I can reuse them. You know, so these are the, the, the shots to get to the, um, the actual artwork later. And again, it's, you know, it's super basic. Oh, and these are the dirty gloves that, uh, so in the archive center, they collect all the gloves afterwards to wash. Um, and I love it because they're so dirty. And I was thinking about the dirtiness of the, of the archive and all that history that you touched. And so uh, during my last day there, I uh, asked if I could take one of the bags of the dirty gloves. Um, and they thought I was crazy. Like they have no idea what I'm doing. They, they, I try to explain it to them and they're just like, I don't know, like, aren't you researching just like these other researchers? And so I have the dirty gloves and I have to figure out what I want to do with it. But that's kind of the long winded, you know, backstory, but a lot of it is spending a lot of time not knowing what's happening. So like most of the time there, I'm like, oh God, I don't know. Okay, shoot, 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 shoot. You know, and then later on, edit, 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 like think about it maybe if I'm lucky, go back a second time. So I, I actually did schedule two visits to the Smithsonian. The first time was just about finding out like what was there. And then the second time was narrowing it down and targeting what I think I needed more of. And then there were a lot of dead ends. Like I wanted to collaborate with the Lunder Center for Conservation at the National Portrait Gallery. And they just had no bandwidth, you know, they just kept like, yeah. Sorry, so that's a long, long answer. That was great. I appreciate, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, have fun. Archives are, they're sexy. I mean, really, you know, it's nerdy. It's nerdy and sexy and I love it. It's just like, you turn over a file and you're like, what? You know, or like you turn, especially if you turn over photographs, oh my God. The things written on the backs of photographs are crazy. And then I have these also other things. So I also had to search for adjacent things. Like if I couldn't find Filipino, I had to look for Oriental. You know, like what? Maybe there's Oriental. You know, <laughs> as you find these really weird things. I have a question. Sure. Um, hi, Stephanie. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I'm working with archives too. Um, I'm investigating. Um, a book that I discovered actually that is related to the colonial administration of Nigeria at the time. And I was in the British archives in the British library last year. Um, and there's not a, enough time in the world, it seems like, in archives. I was wondering, I had two questions, wondering how long, you said you scheduled two um, visits to the archives. And I was wondering how long you were there for each one, if you thought they were, anywhere near enough time. And also <laughs> my second question is, um, I found it really hard to be in these archives, as you said, to be moved by the kind of language that is used for, uh, in my case, blackness, um, to, to read about the sort of extraction, willful extraction of resources and the m amount of money funneled into the colonial experiment to extract these resources. And I was wondering, um, a total aside from art, just like how you cared for yourself and your mental well-being and personhood and the toll archives take on your body um, while you were at this. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you for that question because it actually is something that like, I mean, it's, uh, what is it? If you spend a lot of time doing it, you, you actually don't really get, at least I felt, you don't get um, inured to it, you know? So in other words, like, it wasn't like I would open up a file and be like, oh, you again, ethnographic, horrible image. You know, it was always just like, oh God, oh God. You know, it was, it was just, it's this kind of like litany of like all the evidence about why you are not a human being. And it's, it's so going through that, I think, um, Maybe just since I always had in the notion that my job in that context was to create the counter narrative, you know, I used that as the sort of um, like uh, the, the energy 
you know, to, to do it and keep going. And, and also, thankfully, I was reading a lot of text that I felt um, uh, supported it. So like um, Aisha or Ariella Aisha, Aisha Azule, who's a really amazing photo uh, theorist and critic, writes amazing, um, I'll type it in, Ariella Azule. And everyone should look, look her up because she writes a lot about how uh, photography and archives um, uh, do damage, but also maybe what one can do to like counter that. And so um, highly recommended. So yeah, and other than that, honestly, I spent maybe almost two months uh, doing that, but with lots of gaps in between. And yeah, oh, and actually, yeah, so I also took up knitting because after spending nine in the morning to five in the, in the evening at these archives, I would go back to the, my rental in Washington, DC and just knit all night and watch garbage on TV. I mean, it's, it's the only way, right? You just sort of, no, 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 no. And I got, I, I have like all these great sweaters and, you know, scarves and things like that. Cause yeah, you, you're right. You do need to care for yourself. And that, that was it. Like tune out. Good luck. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, Sandra. So, question. Oh. Um, if I can, if I can sneak in one more question, I'm sorry. Um, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, this is great. Um, I'm wondering about. Um, I was at a conversation earlier today about um, decolonizing the museum, and and just and hearing your your talk today. I mean, I like it's it. You know, there's there's so many problems with like. You know about the history even within the institution not being accurate and you gave such perfect examples about this you know and i think in in the context of like the philippines and and the colonialist uh, the colonialist history of the philippines you've got the americans you've got the spanish you've got so many you know you've got asian powers you've got you know so many different um so many different influences in modern day filipino history um what what is your like what's your like what would be the accurate or sort of um, ideal, I guess, representation, um, like as an artist, like what would be the ideal representation in presenting, I guess? Um, I don't know if that question makes sense. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I know that's an interesting question, right? Like what is the I guess the the not remedy, but you know the the opposite or the or what could be productive and um, probably I would say like community based archiving uh, projects which do exist. So like say in Oakland, uh, you know where I live, there's um, a lot of like um, uh, like photo and family history archiving projects that are directly you know going to the community so that in other words they're not you know they're they're then black. They help people create their own archives and also feed into um, you know, collective ones because that's the other, I think that's the only way that it can happen. Um, otherwise you always still get this top down view, right? Of like what's important and what isn't. Um, the one thing though I should, I should say is like, I, um, it's interesting because like, I don't think I learned a lot about either the Philippines or being Filipino from this project. And I like to stress too that like my work actually doesn't explore at least the way I put it, my work doesn't explore identity in the sense of like my identity. It explores the gaze, like the, the white gaze, <laughs> you know, that, and that's a totally different thing. Like I feel also, oh, this is interesting. If you are an artist of color and you make artwork that in any way has uh, in it depictions of either cultural things that the public thinks is attached to you um, it's automatically assumed that it's about you exploring your identity. And that's been really fascinating too, right? Because like, I try to tell people like, I, I do not feel like a fragmented person. I feel very whole, you know, I'm not searching for my roots. I'm actually looking at how the archive is a, you know, a, a fallible and one dimensional or not one dimensional, but you know, that's a totally other question. So it, it's fascinating. And that's something that I think a lot of artists of color like come up against is this assumption, right? That like, this must be about your exploration of your authentic cultural self. 
or, or, or if it's not, uh, um, I'm older than you, so it used to be, or if it's not, it should be. Oof, God. Wow. Well, I mean, that's why when I, so when I was sewing the green uh, dresses, I love the fact that, you know, it had nothing like to do with, it didn't look like ethnic. It actually was American, you know, in that kind of generic historical way. Um, and I appreciated being able to do that type of work also. Cause right now, you know, the show Native Resolution, it's all talked about through a Filipino lens, which of course makes sense, but I want it to be talked more through white supremacy. Just like, you know, like that headline that I gave, you know, where it was like, let's go to the actual thing it's speaking about, not about necessarily Asian trauma, but. So I think we have um, time for one more question. There's a question in the chat from Nikolai. Did you want to unmute and say your question? Mm. Or if not, I can, it just is ta yeah, talking about um, connections with Hito Styrel's work. Um, and if you can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, Hito Styrel, just like woof, right? Um, so it was interestingly enough, like when I was working, um, I forget what project I was working on, and then I discovered Hito's work, and it was almost like, oh no, she did it already. You know, it was like, oh crap, like the thing that I was working on was almost so close. And so it's been nice uh, knowing her work and being influenced and inspired by it. But I also hope to, <laughs> you know, not get overly influenced uh, by it. But yes, uh, her, um, her theory on uh, the low resolution, you know, like the JPEG and uh, lostiness is incredibly um, a, a foundation to my thinking. You know, it, it freed up everything, right? In Defense of the Poor Image is an amazing essay. And it's, it's like the notion of cannibalism also, like, um, you know, the, the anthropophagy. So, uh, but yeah, no, thanks for asking that. All right. Well, I guess like I, the only thing I want to share is, uh, you know, well, thanks again. Um, I appreciate um, you being open to listening to the, um, the way I tried to structure it today. And um, yeah, hope to meet you all in real life at some point. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Anyone have last words? Oh, thanks, Ken. No, well, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'll see the grads tomorrow that I'm meeting with. So see you here. Thank you, Stephanie. Have a safe flight. To should, I, should I leave? Oh, and then should you talk ab about me with each other? I'll, I'll leave. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody.